Okay, so in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the December 15th meeting of the Budget Committee of the Board of Education of Baltimore County. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting, in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair, in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent, may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, Today's budget committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through a Microsoft Teams live event. Links can be found on the BCPS website and on board docs. In order to conduct this meeting efficiently, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable, as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Additionally, as a courtesy to the committee, I ask that you inform Ms. Bean if you must leave the call by using the Teams chat feature so that a quorum can be maintained. Ms. Bean, please call the roll to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Sorry, Ms. Hen. Present. Ms. Jose. Ms. Mack. Present. Mr. McMillian. Present. Ms. Pasture. Present. Thank you. We do have a quorum. Ms. Bean, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Mr. Saris. Present. Mr. Tantliff. Present. Mr. Corns. Present. Thank you. The first item of new business is five year review number of FTEs for school based positions. Mr. Whit Tantliff will now present the review. Hi. Good evening. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, so uh, what you can see here is we, we uh, if you recall last month, we talked about average salaries for the school based positions. Um, and so there was a request to look at the staffing by year for the FTEs. So that's what we have here. Um, I want to apologize for one thing that I uh, realized uh, this template was showing average salary. So a teacher, special ed teacher, same salary. But uh, we did not add special ed teachers and ESOL teachers onto this list, which I know would be of interest. So, um, uh, you know, if needed after the meeting, we can add those and then repost this document. So uh, apologies for that. Um, so in any case, what we have here is for these uh, key positions, and of course it doesn't include central office um, or the positions I mentioned, but these are kind of the key school positions, you can see the trend by year and for pretty much everything um, it's up. There's there's kind of two items of interest here. Uh, if you're looking through the numbers, you'll see the classroom teachers dropped this year for FY22. Um, and as a reminder to the board, we reduced classroom teachers by 122.3 for FY22 to take into account our drop in enrollment and also to serve um, as budget gap closure. Um, and additionally, there it looks like we dropped by 44, so a total um, of, the, of uh, 166, but actually the other 44 were, um, if you remember the prior year, we converted a bunch of staff development teachers, 90 and a half to be precise, to classroom teachers. Um, that was because the county exec gave us a maintenance of effort budget and didn't fund any extra teachers for enrollment growth. 
um, and they had all for the budget because it was so uh, uh, close to the end, we put them all in regular ed, but it turned out 44 of them needed to be special ed teachers. So uh, if 44 of that drop is just teachers were budgeted as regular ed teachers the prior year, but they were really should have been special ed teachers and we corrected that. Um, and the other item of interest, and again, a hot area that we're trying to invest in is school social workers appear to be dropping by 10, uh, but that's actually not uh, the case. That in FY22, we took the concentration of poverty grant, which is uh, one of the largest and fastest growing components of restricted uh, funding on Blueprint. And that it originally been planned in the general fund when Blueprint first came about, but that um, acts like a grant and it is a grant. It's a reimbursable and we have carryover. So we simply moved all of the positions on the concentration of poverty grant from the general fund to the special fund. And so now uh, if you look in the budget book in FY22, it has its own page under grants. So that's not actually reduc reduction we just um, move those positions to the grant. And uh, with that, I'd be glad to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thanks. Uh, this, is, this is interesting information. I guess just for clarity's sake, are we missing teachers that are funded by grants? And this is a general teachers? fund. This is the general fund. So this isn't a, okay, so this is not a, an, an all-encompassing list of employees that we have. It, it is not. This, the intent of this, or at least what we put together, not that we couldn't put something else together, but this was budgeted positions. This is what the board focuses on. This is what the board can add and subtract during the budget process. So um, I think that was kind of how this came about. So, so the 166 the positions fund. that, you know, basically the drop from 21 to 22. So I'm sorry, say uh, that again. I missed, I, I was talking, sorry. Say so that you, again. you pointed out the 5100 level, right? Yes. And that that's a drop. Yes. So are those positions, have they been moved to another category that's not reflected here? Um. So in the in the budget process, we re, so 44, as I mentioned, just moved to special ed. They were just planned in the wrong place the prior year because of that change that took place late. Um, and the board voted on the budget uh, as a superintendent proposed to reduce classroom teachers by 122.3 to coincide with the enrollment drop. Now we were actually able to plan in the ESSER uh, grant to restore those 122.3 teachers. So for this year only, um, those teachers were budgeted on the ESSER grant. All right, so that's basically another fiscal cliff that we have. We have all these teachers hanging on this grant. When that money is gone, there's no minimum level of effort to, to catch them, is that correct? Well, um, the number of teachers we have will match the enrollment that we're seeing. But in terms of the total staffing, um, we, we didn't fill all 122 of those grant positions, but those would not be available next year. So from that perspective, um, if we don't add them in the new budget, then that would be a drop. So, okay, because yes, I know it was the intention. The way you're stating it. Yeah, it was our intention not to cut teachers. So the way around that was through via the grant, if I recall correctly, which is just a temporary solution, correct? Uh, sure, any grant is only uh, a so it, it can only fund things while it's in existence. And okay. while you and the years you budgeted, you budget for those positions. Thanks. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Thank you. Oops, thank you. Um, Mr. Tantliff, is column B the loaded labor rate or just the basic salary? 
Um, that that uh, was just in here from last month. That was what we budgeted for each position because that was the topic last month. So we just continued that chart. So um, we use, there's a few different ways we budget different positions for the way it makes sense, which I think we discussed last month. So you can you can see in column C that describes how we came up with each of those dollar figures. And uh, so in FY22, any positions that uh, were budgeted with that title, that's uh, what we used for a position that wasn't actually filled. If they're filled, we use the real salary. But are we using the salary? So, you know, my my salary could be 100,000, but when we add in benefits and things like that, the loaded labor rate, it's obviously much higher. So my question is just, is this the person's paycheck or is this the whole package? This is just salary. Um, and generally the way we, uh, communicate the budget uh, because it's just clear that way. Uh, and so if you did an initiative, if you, if you guys made a proposal and you wanted to add 82 of uh, special ed teachers, um, the next week when we provided the cost, we would tell you it's this much in salary, this much in benefits. But the benefits in the budget don't tie to the person. They're all in one bucket. And what generally is that coefficient? Um, you mean just, what percent? Yes. Well, it varies pretty uh, widely depending on your salary. So <clears throat> if you were, and if you, if, if you think about it, if someone's making $25,000, their benefits could be almost 100% of their salary because medical's $15,000, whether you make 20 or whether you make 200. So it really, varies very, very widely. You could use like, you know, 30% for the whole system. Maybe if you're just doing a roundabout estimate, but uh, really it, it varies dramatically depending on the type of position, you know, from 20 up to close to 100%. Okay, and I actually had written 30% because I, I think that's pretty much what most companies use. Um, so thank you for that. And then, um, we received a document that showed teacher vacancies and um, as of 12-6, it was 293.8 vacancies. Okay. Is that reflected at all in line 11? And if so, how? Um, so uh, I have not seen that report, but this, but this uh, number here is budgeted FTEs, so any vacancies would not be reflected. This is fully staffed. If we had no vacancies, how many positions would be filled? Okay, I, mean, I have a question. I just can't get it right in my head. Um, so this is budgeted. Yes. So is it safe to say then that all 5,100 of those positions are filled with the exception mm. of the 293.8? Or is there a number in between that I'm just not thinking about? Um, well, I don't, um, I, I'd have to look at the report you're uh, looking at. So your report may also include other teachers in that bucket. You know, I mean, maybe special ed teachers are in there or other tab co employees. So I'd have to look at the report to answer the question, um, but if it was general fund classroom teachers only, it didn't, you know, it didn't include staff development teachers or other tab co positions, then, you know, that would probably be correct. Okay, but thank you. But I can't say for sure. No, I understand, I understand, report. thank you. What was the number you said again, Ms. Mack? 293.8. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that, and the that title just, is just teacher vacancies doesn't say ESOL special ed. It just says teacher vacancies. OK. Thank you, Mr. Tantliff. Sure. Thank you. Four members, other questions? Miss, Miss Hen, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Mr. McMillian. And actually, Mr. Tant, it, it's just a statement. I'm a little bit surprised that the uh, middle and high school assistant principals 
have stayed that consistent across the board? Because I would think that those positions are, we, we need more of those positions because those, you know, the high schools and middle schools need a lot of help, uh, you know, in the administration and the day-to-day -day operation of those buildings. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Anyone else? Ms. Pester, are you good? Thank you, ma'am. Mr. Tantliff, would it be possible to get these numbers for the grant funded positions as well? Is that something you have access to um, without too much difficulty? You want a separate report for the grant positions? It would be nice to see it broken out by fund if that's possible or just to see which are general fund versus which are grant funded. Um, Let's see. Well, we do a separate report. So you'd want, um, and you know, the grant positions, as you know, what for general fund, if it's budgeted in the budget book, that is the budget, unless, you know, we go to the county and ask for additional FTEs. Grants, of course, it's, it's not perfect because grant applications are still being done after the budget's approved. We get grants in the middle of the year. So, um, you know, I think we could get that, but it would be a uh, little work. Like, are you thinking by grant you would want it? Oh, no, just by title, similar to what you're showing. I so mean, the exact many... same report you're showing here. Just to understand what the total number of um, budgeted FTEs would be, including the grant funded positions. Let me, uh, I'll, I'll uh, look at that. Do you want to add something, George? Yeah, just um, briefly, uh, page 17 of our adopted budget does give you a snapshot um, of the general, special, and enterprise fund FTEs. Uh, the total grant funded positions for this year are 936. And I don't know that we've ever done a report breaking those out by job description, but uh, as Mr. Tantla said, uh, we can see what is available to us. Okay. It would be helpful, I think, because as the board makes motions to um, increase our staffing level, because our our priority is people, right, for our schools, it's it's helpful to get an overall sense of how many FTEs by position we have. And and this is fantastic, Mr. Tantlow. So thank you for putting this together for us. I, I want to make sure that we are basing our decisions on the complete picture. And as Mr. Kuhn asked, um, if there are some positions that are grant funded that we're not including, I just want to make sure we have that data as well and that we're considering that. So that we base them on accurate numbers. Not that these aren't accurate, but general fund plus our grant funded positions so that we get that full picture. Ms. Uh, Hay, only can I get that number again that Mr. Saris gave for the grant? Yes, 936 positions. Thank you. Uh, I was going to say, Ms. Hay, the only one uh, thing I'd say to keep in mind, there. Just because Esser's around now, now, there are a number of positions that got added that essentially serve the same purpose as a general fund position. But outside of that, um, you know, Title I, the IDA pass through special ed grant, those positions are very dedicated and specific in the way they're used. So I wouldn't think that, uh, although it, I'm not saying it wouldn't be interesting, but I wouldn't think that would really impact your decision on, you know, where where there might be gaps. Sure. I'm I'm thinking about positions that the board has added through motions in the past. We generally don't specify the funding source. Of course, this is giving me ideas to <laughs> to that effect, but not that we necessarily care. We we care about putting, you know. <laughs> resources in our schools, right? Um, but it, it would be helpful to know 
and to plan for the future it, to consider the the fact that um the grant may be temporary it may not be it may be right but in in planning and looking at what our needs will be it's helpful to know which will need local funding moving forward when when considering what positions we add because again that's that's our priority as many um board members have stated okay well we'll see what we can come up with uh on the grant and i think if nothing else um maybe we could just supply the titles for the esser grants since those are the most flexible and have a cliff whereas title one the other you know ida those those are not really the same situation but we'll um let us look what we can reasonably get in the uh middle of you know we're pulling all the budget together too so that takes up a lot of staff time at the moment sure and if if it would be um easier to narrow down or to to provide it for certain positions there are um, some that are of more interest to the board for instance those that we've made motions to increase in the past if if you would like to narrow it down and focus it focus on those um, school-based okay. for instance school-based positions things that we've we've increased in the past okay if that's helpful okay we'll um we'll get something that'll be helpful for you thank you any other questions board members okay hearing yes, none I have a follow-up question yes miss mack and i don't know mr tantliff if you can answer this now but for assistant principal staffing is there a formula and if so is the formula on AP to number of students, AP to number of students in poverty, um, AP number of AP given because of Title I designation. I, how do we decide how many assistant principals a school gets? Uh, it's it's the enrollment in the school. Strictly enrollment. Yes, I believe so. Yes, and Miss Mac, that's on page one twenty nine of the budget document. OK. And Mr. McMillian, his observation is very accurate. Um, we have not added many assistant principals over the years. Um, and I believe that's something that was discussed by Dr. Williams and his staff during their budget development work sessions well and actually mr um mcmillian's question is what prompted me um because i often hear of discrepancies uh even in my own district where a school with 700 students i'll use elementary school may have two ap's but another school with the same number doesn't have two ap's and i'm just wondering how we get there i thought it had maybe other factors in it, but it doesn't sound like it does. The the other factors are applied by the superintendent and human resources. So the total number is similar to teachers. We budget based on uh, enrollment, but how those uh, assignments are actually made does take into account special circumstances such as the extraordinary large Perry Hall Middle School or other schools that are experiencing special needs. OK, thank you for that clarification. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, this is a great view and I appreciate it. One of the things that I'm very interested in is basically a school based budget that would break down how much money is going to each school and for what does that. Does that not exist at this point in time? Um, so uh, there is some reporting 
uh, that Mr. Saris could speak to a little better from an accounting standpoint that we're required to do now called ESSA. Um, George, you want to see with that answer Mr. Kuhn's question? Uh, to not directly, but the ESSA reporting requirement now uh, provides per pupil spending at each school. That is different than a budget. Um, well, all right, let's just. Yeah. So what I'm really trying to get to is how much money is going to each school and then the breakdown because we now we have some of this information and in essence we could marry it all up. But if it exists and you say, OK, there, you know, at school X, there's X millions of dollars going to that school this many teachers, this many principal, you know, principal, vice principal, whatever, just a whole picture so that people, so it's available for people because yeah, we also MS have populations, right? Yeah, it's on the MSD website. Um, and MSD, MSDE? MSDE website. And uh, I don't know that, I don't know that we publish it because we give them the data that they publish, but um, I can. Uh, OK, is there anything a, missing from that data? I'll send you a link to that. Um, is it ESSA? Yeah. Reporting yeah. Requirement? Last year was the first year that we that that report came into an ex, into existence and we're working on the second year of that report now. So what does it do? Uh, December 21st, I think. Oh, OK, so it's coming up. Yeah. But I'll right. I'll send the link to the board uh, to the committee. Great, thank you. Thanks, George. Thank you. So is that level of reporting new then, Mr. Saris? I know MSDE previously reported it at the district level. Right. And I'm OK, so they they had not reported it at the school level. So is the right. SF per pupil spending report at the school level new then? Yes, it's a new federal requirement. Mm -hmm. OK. I know you mentioned that was new. I didn't know if they yeah. they reported it at the school level differently before. I don't recall seeing it on yeah. the website. And you know, as with all of these budget issues, it's it's heavily driven by salaries. Um, and the school the budgets that the school actually receive are just for operating supplies. You know, it doesn't include electricity and trash collection and water and sewage and lots of <laughs> lots of big ticket items that that we really allocate in this reporting structure um, based on square footage mm. for example and and other uh, mathematical methods right but would you say roughly 80 percent the salaries that's the yeah. number i yeah. always think of okay which we have here as mr kuhn said you could back into it by position roughly. Um, of course, the salaries vary widely, but. I mean, I, to be honest with you, this is a good start, right? Start. But, you know, uh, George, what you were just saying about it doesn't have these other big ticket items. I would like to see, hey, here's every penny going into every school so that people just have an understanding because a lot of times I've heard things that I just don't know are correct or not, where they're like, oh, well, this this school is starved of resources and this school gets more than it should deserve it deserves or whatever. And it's 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 also goes to the equity question like how at what level is this school, you know, um, um, resourced? Yeah, and it's exactly for that equity picture that the government has required this now because of that that's a long-standing 
concern. Right. Is it, I know we're speaking to operating, but is there an equivalent capital report by school? No. Okay. No. Um, Do we produce one or is that something we can produce? Well, I mean, we, we produce a quarterly report of capital projects. Do you get that? Um, that's the closest. Th I mean, it's at a school level in terms of where all the project work is done, but it's it's not. You know, allocated on a per pupil basis or. But I believe it's by. Area, I mean, we're required to file it with and share it with the county and I thought the board, but if if you're not familiar with it. No, I don't think we're getting it. And okay. so well, I'd like to see that. Yeah. And I'd also like to see the capital expenditures by school. If that's something, do we produce that for internal use? No, but but this will show you every capital project that's active. And and what the year to what the project to date expenditures are. So that may be it's a pretty long list. Right. I mean, it, it's an equity issue as well. Like Mr. Kuhn said, I I'm interested in maybe not lifetime. I mean, I'd love the, the lifetime data, but I'm interested in seeing what our capital investment is by school to to look to those issues to see that we are. So investing is, our capital dollars equitably across the system. This is the closest thing I know to that. Um, I don't know if Mr. Dixit has anything else, but uh, I'll make sure that the board has access to that report and then uh, Mr. Dixit can tell us I think you've asked him that question. And I I've did asked. with re with regards to my iPass because mm -hmm. Canon had built a dashboard that's still labeled under construction, but it looked like that was the intent. Now, I don't know whether they were provided any underlying data to populate it, but I asked Canon mm -hmm. that if they were given that and they said yes, that was the plan for that dashboard. Now, that never came to fruition, so that would be helpful to see at a on a school by school basis. OK, well, what has been invested. Get you and back. I did ask Mr. Dixit for that. Yeah, I think what we have is certainly available. Uh, what we can create is another <laughs> question, so um, I'll uh, deal with what I know we have. OK, the IAC publishes it going back to I want to say 2000 maybe. Um, but that's just the state contribution on capital projects that have state contributions. It doesn't include right. any um, completely locally funded projects or the local contribution. So it's not a complete picture of the investment. Yeah, and I'm not sure that this isn't just for county dollars, but regardless, I'll get it for you. Thank you. OK, Miss Han, I had a question or comment. Sure, Miss Mack. Um, I had created a spreadsheet to try to gather information at a school level similar to what uh, Mr. Kuhn just mentioned. And for the funding sections, I had dollar per student from the operating budget, meaning the money allocated through the schoolhouse budget, Title one dollars per student, grant dollars per student, special education add on other funds per student and then total funds per student, which would be. A total of those um, columns were there. Other than um, grants and ESSER funds, would there be any other. Standard funds per student. Um, that would give money to schools. Or I took them right out of the budget book. I guess I'm asking, did there, I miss anything? There's magnet funds. OK. There's multiple grants. You know, actually the magnet's a good example. There's the, the large magnet grant that's sunsetting now. 
<clears throat> but, you know, uh, any school that has a magnet program, we give the magnet funds that get allocated by the magnet office. Um, the schools that are on that magnet expansion grant, you know, they got teachers and programmatic dollars funded. So, you know, there's items like that. OK, well, thank you, because I did not. He, I actually heard about the magnet funds last night for, for the first time or the grant, I should say. Um, OK, and then my other question is, I should know this. I've been on the board three years, but how many total schools do we have? Well, we have 175 schools and programs. Why are we only budgeting 165 nurses? Um, there might not be a full FTE at each program. I'd have to check if there, there might be some halves. I think that's right. OK, thank you. I think if your population's small enough, you probably don't need a 1.0. I would say the last year, schools would argue that they probably needed a 3.0, but um, I, thank you for answering the question. Right. And some schools have more than a 1.0. I know the larger schools, right? So it's not necessarily a one-to-one. -one. And there's health assistance too that are available. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. OK, so I think we're ready to move on now to the second item of business. Thank you for that report, Mr. Tantliff. Sure. Um, item two on our agenda is the 10 year energy cost summary by line item. And you got that, can you all see that right now. We do. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the request uh, was to have a 10 year history trend uh, and this was all on board docs if you'd like to look at it. Um, so this is a 10 year trend for all the major buckets that fall under energy. Um, you know, as we had said in our back and forth when setting the agenda, uh, if if the committee desires to have a detailed discussion behind planning and usage, and that sort of thing, it would probably be best to to request that be set up with um, Dr. Wheatley Phillip and uh, Mr. Dixit. But uh, this here is basically a summary of the reporting. Let me get my mouse in the right place. Um, the only uh, small caveat uh, that I'd mentioned, I know Mr. Kuhn, you've uh, mentioned this topic before, the energy performance contracts. Um, for the several years, we break them out now into their own uh, lease line for the capital portion of the energy performance contracts. Um, but prior to that, it was mixed in in contractual, so it wasn't broken out on this report for the, you know, four years or so prior to that, but, you know, we could uh, pull those dollars together if needed. Well, thank you, because you just answered my first question. <laughs> I, I saw, please. Yeah, I, I know, and uh, Mr. Saris, I know we had met uh, with Mr. Dixit, I believe, specifically about those, I, I believe they're 20-year leases, correct? Correct, yes. Right, so, um, so I don't know how far out there they anticipate, you know, we anticipate them going or how far back, you know, when they started, but I'm guessing it's pretty steady spend on those. Yeah, the the like like most um, of these payments, the the payment amount is fairly consistent. The the com the composition of principal and interest varies, you know, over time, but they are fixed price leases and there are three different sets of leases so uh they they started in around 2014 so they would start to end in 2034 um but you you've got three different sets of payments that are all being reported in this one line item 
and they're going to vary by the size of the project, the interest rate, <coughs> and but so this is all three of them together. Yeah. Uh, honestly, I think that um, you know what what was explained to me was actually a very good story, um, and that <clears throat> and that it should be explained, perhaps written up, so that instead of having meetings and people asking questions about it in the future you could simply say here's everything that's happening so you know come to me once you've finished reviewing this uh because it's slightly it's fairly complicated um and i don't really want to spend a lot of time i at first i just want to th say thank you uh for pulling this information together um are there things that you would like to highlight and and point out here um it, you know, in this table, I mean, it, it shows we spend a significant amount of money on energy. Um, um, it does show that uh, in 21, you can see a lot of the dollars are low because uh, school was closed for a lot of the year, you know, so bus fuel we'd expect to be down. Um, gas and electric was pretty flat and that's because, you know, I think the buildings were open even uh you know i mean the buildings themselves didn't shut down they still had maintenance going on so you still had heat and air conditioning uh but the difference from year to year has a lot of puts and takes so that's something to remember so the the costs are going down but that's at the same time where we've been adding a tremendous amount of air conditioning over the last half a decade so we've offset that cost but some of that's also natural gas prices dropping and so to really understand the difference from year to year, you know, it's a combination of square footage, what new requirements came online, and what's the price and what's the usage. So um, the facilities group that puts this together, uh, they put detail back up in with their budget line. So they're, uh, for all of these, they forecast usage, normally based on historical usage, um, they have an intelligent guesstimate or projection on BTU costs, on per gallon costs, et cetera. Um, so they're not, in other words, just saying, OK, I spent this much last year. Let me tweak that by a couple percent. It's, it's really a very granular level that they do this planning. And of course, you're not going to always uh, get it right by any means with the volatility that's out there. But a lot of the contracts are uh, fixed for the year. And so, um, you know, that's all taken into account when they uh, project their costs. And we continue to grow and open new facilities. So, you know, I'm. I am very curious as as to, you know, how we account and budget for it, I'm guessing. They just feed that information to you to say these three facilities will be online at this point in time and you know we'll be buying electricity and gas and everything else for them is that basically how it works yeah when they again they're they're looking in, into their total usage for the year and that would be a factor that would increase their usage so they're taking that into account at a very granular level Right. estimating how much more air conditioning heating etc would be used when that building comes online or when that building gets renovated and expands or when that building gets new air conditioning versus old air conditioning that's more efficient or just gets new air conditioning in the first place or when we're charging 111,000 laptops at our facilities yes that well yes that could certainly be happening Right. Um, so thanks. This is great. I, I did send an email uh, just before this meeting uh, to, to Dr. Williams. Uh, and um, I think you said uh, Dr. Wheatley um, is involved in the energy side and facility side. So he's reporting to her right now. Right. So that's she was copied on it. But some of the details you're talking about and and how we handle energy and sustainability in the environment on the other side. Um, but like you said, the cost of the inputs like the gas, the electricity, you know, we just we just approved a contract to pay a consultant, I believe, to help us with managing those costs. 
right, Mr. Sparris? That was yeah. within the last month. Um, yeah, this is uh, the consultant that we uh, share with county government as part of our participation in the the regional purchasing committee um, and uh, you know Baltimore County combines our demand uh, with theirs and adds it to the group and then that consultant uh, advises us on purchasing you know a certain amount of fixed price contracts and planning you know for 20 percent or so uh, of purchases on the spot markets um, and that there really is a broader portfolio management of the whole system right and we have such a large footprint and if we're you know combining that with the county which is unclear as to how that works which i would actually like clarity about um that is good for us right I mean, it's good yeah. for the organization and it was on the news yesterday that the retail price of electricity and energy you know uh, when they went into deregulation was a big win for large customers but the average citizen is actually paying more because they're not sensitive and paying attention to it so my my expectation is that bcps comes out a big winner in these situations right the price per kilowatt should be much lower and the yeah. gas that we're buying should be significantly lower than your average residential customer um so i'm you know i don't know what insight you all have to that and if you're you know if that request comes across your desk you know <laughs> you can tell them this is part of what mr Kuhn's interested in i just yes. want to understand what's happening and i do want to understand across the facilities what the facility looks like right um because we have very efficient new buildings and very old buildings that my guess was are very inefficient on on many levels so this these are the kinds of things i'm trying to understand that's why i ask these questions it's, it's yeah. not for fun and no, i mean no. i know you guys enjoy it <laughs> right george well, you enjoy when i ask questions <laughs> Fortunately, uh, Mr. Dixit first joined the organization as our energy management specialist. So he is the the person to talk to um, and, and can address those questions. You know, you mentioned uh, the, the variation between buildings. All of our, you know, climate controls are are computerized and managed centrally and building temperatures go up and down depending on you know night and day and weather and so forth and so they do have a comprehensive management program just for each building in addition to the purchasing that's great uh, yeah and I, mean, and I live in a house that was built in the 40s and i can feel the wind blow right <laughs> and i've made investments to try and yeah. shore some of that up so my my guesstimation is a lot of the old stock of facilities we have you know aren't as efficient as as the newer ones so i'd right. be interested in that i know that we have programs to do that and i'm always looking for us to save taxpayer dollars as we move forward in this but this but is great. I really appreciate it. One thing this chart shows is that we have held, we, costs have been held down um, over time, and there's an intangible factor there vis-a-vis uh, -vis the environment, you know. Right, and, and, and again, this is a good story, right? With more facilities, I mean, 2012 compared to today, or the 2023 budget, you know, this is significantly less that you're asking for, or almost the same amount for gas and electric. And I'm guessing we use significantly more electricity at this point in time. Yes. 
Yes, right. we have to. Absolutely. Then, yeah, so, so that growth and understanding that's important. Thanks, so that, Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mr. Kuhn. Thank you for raising this as an agenda item. This is huge, so I appreciate it. Um, I just have a quick question, then I'll turn it over to um, other board members that may have questions. Um, noticing with our bus fuel costs, declining costs, and I'm wondering if that is um, due to the increased use of contract transportation services, or if you attribute it to something well, else between 2012 uh, and 2020. Well, I think uh, so without doing a deep dive, I know the price of gas is significantly cheaper than it was at that peak. Um, and I'm guessing some of the shift may be part of it, but I, I cannot definitively answer that question without a deeper dive. But I would think the biggest driver is the price of fuel per gallon. That much, huh? OK, because it's a looks like a third where no, a chunk is spending it, I, a third. I, I, yeah, a chunk of it probably is increased use of contract buses, as you mentioned too, Ms. Hen. That that's probably it. But it would just take a deeper deeper dive to to give you a clear answer to that question. Okay, thank you. And then it was mentioned that um, 2021, um, the decline due to schools being closed again with bus fuel, but I would expect to see even less costs um, with schools closed because we're not transporting students and we still have 1.4 million in costs for bus fuel. Is that something you can speak to or not without? I don't want to put you on the spot. Um, oh, well, I guess what I'd say is the buses were we're using a lot of buses to deliver meals last year. Um, school was in session for the fourth quarter. So even though it might have only been a quarter of the students, I think probably all the routes or just about all the routes might have still been driven, you know, with empty buses, you know, with only a handful of children on each bus. Um, but I, uh, I'm guessing those would be the biggest uh, reasons why it isn't lower. But 2020, I'll mention too, Q4 didn't deliver children. Right. So the buses were pretty idle in 2020. So if you look at, at the better comparison might be to 2019, the full mm -hmm. the last full year. And there it's probably more in line with your expectations. It's about 40% of the full year 2019. 20 was only three quarters of a year. Okay. And um, I, I can tell you that our contract routes have gone from 10% to about 20% of the total routes. So that on it in itself is probably not enough uh, to move the fuel needle, but I do think pricing uh, for diesel has come down. Uh, and it's been down really. I mean, natural gas and diesel have all been at fairly low market points uh, for this period and until really just re the recent spike. Oh, um, okay. I thought we, we had added, I guess we can't make that correlation then. We have added substantially more contract routes, but it's it yeah. only represents 10%. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a 100% increase, but it's 10% of the total, the 20%. So probably not the major factor here. And, and I can remember uh, paying when our diesel prices were close to $4. And I can remember when they more recently have been $2. So... Sure. I think that probably has something a bigger is a bigger factor. Okay, thank, thank you. you. So Ms. Mack has a comment. Ms. Mack. That was an old comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you have any comments or questions? I don't. Add to this? Okay, thank you. Mr. McMillian, how about you? I'll say this now before the end. I really appreciate 
the availability of Mr. Witt, Mr. George for us. I, I think that these meetings are some of the some of the most valuable that we have because you two guys and, and I'm not blowing smoke here. You two guys are, are two of the most knowledgeable men there are in our school system. And to have access to you and, and you to answer our questions, you, you know, it's just amazing. I just wish there was more cooperation like this across the entire board. So, gentlemen, thank you very, very much for your availability and your, your you know, your honesty and answer to these questions. Thank you. I'll Thanks second that. Thank you. Thank you. That's a nice uh, holiday sentiment. We appreciate yeah. it. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Mr. McMillian. Could not agree more. Thank you both. Okay. That brings us to our third and final item, which is a spotlight on spend replacement tutorial. So, Mr. Saris. Okay, so would it be helpful for me to start with our home page and try to guide you if I were to share. I don't know, Jim, if I share my screen, would that work here? Mr. Saris, it sure would. You can go ahead and do that. Okay. Yeah, whatever let you're me, looking at, George, they should see. Okay, let me give this a try. Um, and I'm going to start here with our home page. Uh, because we're we're it's we're still getting used to navigating our new environment. So uh, if we go, uh, I'll go to system, and then uh, down to organizational structure, and then to fiscal services. And over here on the left to purchasing. The one thing that we've tried to do just since we're here um, is principals have asked for easier access to resources. And as we've sort of rebuilt our web presence and our online resources, I've tried to put everything from all of my offices onto this one page with the hope that it'll be easier for people to find. Um, and so here we would go to purchasing. And the last two items here, the spend analysis is sort of our, our current work in progress. Spotlight on spend is the uh, the outsourced product that we used uh, up until 2020, and it's uh, much more user friendly. What we are uh, and and now I'll go and and here would be uh, the the current uh, built uh, in-house product, and I will switch over to that. It takes a while to come up here. So you should see what looks like a an Excel spreadsheet. Yes, we can okay. see that. So this is the underlying data that we now uh, compile ourselves. And um, as you, as I've mentioned, uh, you know, throughout our recovery, uh, we've been rebuilding uh, lots of these resources and we now have the ability as of today um, to start updating this data on a on a quarterly basis. Uh, we've been doing it at the end of each year and um, so we have made that 
uh, advancement. And then we will put a, a user overlay here, a dashboard that will make it much easier to use this data because normally if this were an Excel spreadsheet, I could sort it um, and we and really this is a smart sheet mm. and doesn't have that ability. So it's 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 not as uh, as user friendly, but it will be soon. And so uh, let's see, I'm going to go to the top here and I think you see the across the top. Lakeshore Learning, uh, zip code, uh, spend uh, uh, amount of a of a uh, an invoice and a description here, classroom supplies, and then the fiscal year. And so, in order to do some uh calculations uh what i would have to do is for this vendor i will manually have to go uh down here to the lake shore to the bottom of that where that vendor stops and then i would have to uh, go over here to the spend amount and scroll up to highlight, for example, everything in FY20. In order to come down here and see that the total for that vendor for that year is 23,000. $302 and 74 cents and the average purchase is $217 and by contrast the uh, the spotlight product which was uh, a purchase product that we had to feed data into was much easier to use um, and so if I were to do another search, I would go up here to find and let's say I wanted to search on fuel um, and come up short. Uh, let me try something else. George, it might have been because you have column C highlighted. Oh, uh, well, that could be. Let's if you just just touch the top left corner so the whole spreadsheet's highlighted. Yeah, there you go. Okay, let's try. Well, we'll try fuel again. OK, so excellent technology tip from Mr. Tantlin. <laughs> uh, so we would be able not easily, uh, but be able to page through here and find, uh, for example, diesel fuel. Um, and as you can see, without the ability even to sort this as a, as you might normally sort an Excel spreadsheet, it's a lot uh, more difficult to use. And uh, hopefully we will be able to put the dashboards overlay here and make it a lot more similar to the spotlight on spend uh, product that we have that goes from 2019 back to 2012. So Mr. Sarris, this um, you said it's a smart sheet, so it can't be yeah. exported to Excel or there's no way currently to get the same Excel functionality. Um, I think for the public, the answer is no, because um, only we have a limited number of licenses that allow you to do those functions online 
And so, uh, but let me let me find out if I can uh, if there is that ability. I don't. I think it's not going to be uh, publicly available, but I will check. Okay. And as I said, this is a, a recent development at which we are actively uh, upgrading. And we had a major breakthrough today, and I'm hoping for another one in a couple months. Uh, but for now, this is what we have. Um, and uh, it's transparent, but it's not user friendly, unfortunately. Well, those are both exciting updates, both the quarterly updates as well as the dashboard. So that's really going to be the, the most important. The. We would it would take us six months. With the old system to upload and verify all the data and then export it to Spikes Cavell and have them put it in in their template and and post it for us. And so while this is not ideal, I think it's a step uh, toward getting where we we would like to all be. And um, I'll just mention that that this is actually no longer a legislative requirement. Um, the Transparency Act was actually repealed in 2019, but it's this is a very important best practice for us. So we uh, are, are putting uh, a lot of our resources into this and a few other things. Well, this is terrific. And and I was aware of that, that act being repealed. So I'm extremely grateful and proud that we are committed to transparency. So that's fantastic and that Thank we're making. You. And I'm very glad that we, we are taking these steps and have a solution that does not require six months of work to get data into a system that yeah that sounds so, i think painful we're, yes it, it was believe me <laughs> <laughs> extremely so all good news and if you could let the committee know as we make progress on that that's exciting so, sure thank, thank you. you for taking us through the tool um, I'm excited and the public will be able to access this through the website so it's even yeah. more accessible to them. So even they better. Access it now. Yep. OK. Terrific. Um, board members, any other questions or comments? No? OK, thank you very much, Mr. Saris. You're welcome. And with that, um, that's our last item of business for today. The next meeting of the Budget Committee will be on January 5th, 2022. And because there's no further business, this meeting is adjourned. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you. Thank Another you. great meeting. Take I appreciate care. everyone's hard work. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you so Bye. much. Have a great Bye. night.